Welcome, fellow beekeepers. This is Jamie Walters, OSBA's Maumee Valley Director and News Editor. I'm pleased to announce OSBA's new live webinar training series. Live sessions are recorded on the second and fourth Sunday of each month, 7 p.m. through Zoom conference call. You're welcome to attend by making a reservation on OSBA's website at www.ohiostatebeekeepers.org. Go to the events page and scroll down to the event you would like to attend. Confirm your RSVP by filling out the registration form with your city, state, name, and email address. Approximately two hours before the beginning of Sunday's webinar, an active Zoom link will be sent to your email address. Each training session will be recorded and posted on the following Sunday on OSBA's new YouTube channel. You can find it at Ohio State Beekeepers Association. You're welcome to subscribe and be sure to click the bell to be alerted each time we upload a new video. Each month's speakers and presentation will be posted on the Facebook page, by direct email to registered and paid members, and our website at ohiostatebeekeepers.org. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at editor at ohiostatebeekeepers.org. And now on to our previous recorded webinar. Well, we're going to talk tonight about all the different things that you can um, harvest from your hive and, and a little bit about why you might want to do that. Um, so um, just to give you a little background, um, we got started in beekeeping in about 2010 and um, we kind of got into it with our friends, Pete and Lori Dotson, and I was busy teaching school and I was getting old and I had way too much to do and I really didn't want to do bees. <laughs> so I kind of sat out at the beginning, but I like to um, read and, and learn information, you know, things I can share with my students. So I started reading about, um, you know, the bees, of course, that beekeeping for dummies kind of called me across the room. And eventually I, I kind of got interested in the benefits of honey. And I found this book called The Honey Revolution. And that kind of got me started on this whole um, search for information about things in the hive. As I was reading The Honey Revolution, I kind of started seeing the word propolis. And at that time, I really didn't know what propolis was. Um, but I, I got interested in it. And I found just those two little books that you can see there were the only thing I could find, you know, eight years ago, um, found them on Amazon. And they're just little booklets, almost like 25, 30 pages long. But it talked about propolis as this great um, health product and med medicine, kind of a natural medicine. And I got really interested in and uh, kind of started really devouring that. And then I found NIH.gov, which is the website for the National Institutes of Health website. And oh my goodness, if you want to read to your heart's content about all of the hive resources, every single one of them, from honey to, to royal jelly and bee venom, are, are found there with tons and tons and tons of research. Uh, and you can just you know, read forever to, to find out about the benefits of, of these things that the bees make for us in their hives. Um, then this, this particular resource is one that you, you may really wanna take a look at. This is found on the uh, Food and Agriculture Organizations. Um, it's the, actually a branch of the United Nations, um, .org, FAO.org. And if you search very carefully, value added products from beekeeping, you kind of have to get it word for word to make it come up. You will get this booklet online that's about 200 pages long. And it will tell you about every single hive resource, what it's made of, how the bees make it, how to harvest it, how to clean it, how to use it. It gives recipes. Um, it talks about um, uh, what the market for it is in different regions of the world. Uh, so it's really an outstanding uh, resource for, for anything you want to do with any of the hive resources. So that really kind of piqued our interest and got us going on this. So, whoops, my goodness, it's moving without me doing anything. Um, we're going to start, with, start out with honey, and, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll hear some things that you didn't know. And I, I think um, our feeling is that as beekeepers, it's really important for us to know the value of our products, of, of the things that are in our hive so that not only can we support our, our hobby or our small uh, business or whatever, but you know, also to share with our customers and, and kind of elevate the, the status of the bee in, in um, the, our communities so that people realize how 
important they are. Um, well, now I got to get, there we go, Whoop, backwards. Um, honey actually has been, uh, you know, written about back in history, way back to the beginnings of time almost. It was used as food. It was made into mead for drink. It was used as money and also as medicine. And you can follow it through every single holy book that, that is out there from the Quran to the Bible. Um, it is talked about in history. Um, you, they can trace it back to the ancient Egyptian times and it was used, um, of course, as food and drink, but also as medicine. Um, they traded with it. The ancient Romans used it. So it, it's been all through our history um, as more than just something sweet to eat. Um, now, pure raw honey is um, part, ha, about equal amounts of glucose and fructose. It's not the same components that you find in table sugar. You know, they try to tell us on TV that table sugar and, and uh, high fructose corn syrup and honey are all the same, and they're really not. Um, uh, table sugar is sucrose. But it's important to know that because it, it is metabolized very differently in our body because of that. Glucose and fructose are, um, are simple sugars, and so they don't have to be broken down um, and digested in the stomach, and they go into the, the intestines where they're absorbed. Fructose is absorbed very slowly, so um, honey has a, a less of an impact on your blood sugar. It doesn't sp spike your blood sugar as much. Honey is also full of nutrients, um, including protein, vitamins, minerals, a lot of antioxidants. So it has um, very beneficial effects inside our body as an antioxidant. Um, it also has some components that um, actually are not digested at all and not absorbed into the bloodstream, um, but they go into the large intestine and they help promote the growth of beneficial bacteria. It's, it, they're called, um, uh, oh gosh, let me think a minute if I can find the word. I'm not seeing it on my notes here, but anyway, um, oh, oh, ogliosuccharides, but they are actually something that's found in probiotics. So honey has that effect, a similar effect to probiotics um, to help with the, the beneficial bacteria in your gut. Um, has a lot of, of health benefits. Um, one of the things that, that happens with honey is that the fructose is actually absorbed and stored in the liver. And that is where your brain gets its energy. The brain can't pull um, the, the fructose and, and uh, glycerides out of the muscles. And so if it's not in the liver to be transported to the brain, then your brain gets hungry. And one, they say one of the reasons that sometimes we wake at night is if our brain is hungry. And so they say, if you're having trouble sleeping, to try taking a spoonful of honey before you go to bed at night, and that can actually help you sleep better. It's also a great um, energy booster for exercise. And because it's absorbed more slowly than sugar or high fructose corn syrup, it's really good um, for exercise for athletes, either before, during, or after a workout. Um, it promotes uh, good things in your bloodstream. Um, it prevents hypoglycemia. It has a lower insulin response. Um, it also can help reduce oxidative stress in our bodies because it gathers free radicals with those antioxidant components. It also can help um, protect your heart um, and protect against elevated triglycerides. So it does have a lot of you know, health benefits that other sugars do not. It also has medical uses. Um, honey is actually um, antibacterial and it is now being used in just about every nursing home and, and hospital in the country. Typically what they use is Manuka honey and it comes from the, the Manuka trees in New Zealand. It has the highest rate of the antibacterial properties. However, even the raw honey that we have in our hives will kill bacteria and can be used on wounds. Um, the, uh, what happens with it is that it's, first of all, it's acidic. So it kind of prevents some of, of the bacteria from growing because it makes the wound acidic. But honey, um, because it's hygroscopic and it gathers moisture from the air, in a wound, it actually pulls the moisture out of the bacteria and that's how it kills them. It also um, creates small amounts of hydrogen peroxide in a wound. And that helps with debriding the wound of the dead tissue. 
um, you know, in the hospital, if they're going to debride a wound, they're going to dump hydrogen peroxide in your wound, and it's not going to feel very good. But uh, this happens in little tiny amounts with the honey in a wound, and that is how um, it gets rid of that dead tissue and debris in in um, in a wound. Uh, so again, something that can be used medicinally um, as well. Can also be used at home. You're just your raw honey out of the hive is great on wounds. I found out that my very oldest friend has always used honey on wounds because she's allergic to the uh, carrier in the, the triple antibiotic, and I never knew that. Of course, it's a little messy. You'd want to cover it. Um, it's also great for um, skin and for hair. It helps hold moisture and, and add moisture to your skin and your hair, so it can be used as a, as a face mask, and you can actually put a little in shampoo. Honey has been proven by research to be better for a cough than dextromethorphan for cough suppression and again for helping you sleep. Now the raw honey um, is better of course with in, in uncooked foods because you, you keep those benefits that are will be destroyed by heat but it is great in cooking. Um, if you use honey in baked goods it makes them very soft and have kind of a different mellow flavor um, to what you're baking. So lots of different things that we can do with honey to add value. When they call something a value-added product, it means that you've taken something, an agricultural product, and you've changed it in some way so that it has more value, hence you can charge more. Um, so that's what the term means. So of course, you can, you can sell honey by um, the comb, or you can put a chunk in a jar. You can make creamed honey, which we'll talk about. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, which we'll talk about in a minute about how to do it. You can also make bee bread outside um, the hive and we're gonna talk tonight about how to do that as well. Um, you can make infused and flavored honeys and honey butters. Now it used to be in Ohio that you weren't allowed to do that in your home, but about three years ago, the law changed. Honey is, is not a cottage food, it has its own set of laws. And as of a few years ago, we can now make um, infused and flavored honeys in our home and still, it's still legal to do that and then sell it. You don't have to do it in a special um, certified kitchen. So we'll talk a little bit about, a little bit about how to do some of these. Um, you can also put it as an ingredient in skin and hair care. Um, it again adds that antibiotic property and the moisture retaining property to those items. So here's a few things. Um, if you want to write some recipes down. They, they aren't real long. You might want a paper and pen to, to do that. Um, make creamed honey. Um, you All you need is a starter. To make creamed honey, you kind of do what you do when you make uh, sourdough. You need a, a seed of creamed honey. So you have to find somebody that has creamed honey or buy a container of, of creamed honey that is already you know, in that form. And what you do is put a tablespoon or two of the creamed honey in your jar of liquid honey. Mix it up really good and then put it in a cool place for a couple of weeks. Um, you can put it in the refrigerator or you can just put it in a, a cool place like basement or whatever. And over a couple of weeks time, that seed of creamed honey will turn the whole jar into creamed honey. And creamed honey is, is not you know, I, I have actually looked online and some people call creamed honey honey that they've whipped with a mixer. That's not what creamed honey is. Creamed honey is where there's a special um, uh, crystallization process that happens, but instead of getting that honey that's like eating sand where it's real sharp and, and gritty in your mouth, creamed honey, in the process of creamed honey, the, the crystals are made very tiny and smooth. And so what you end up with is the texture of like peanut butter. And I always tell people it's honey that stays where you put it. So when you pick your biscuit up, it doesn't run down your arm and end up on your shirt. Um, but that's something, it's a texture that a lot of people like and it's still considered raw honey. So because you haven't heated it or done anything to destroy those raw properties. Another thing that you can do is make infused or flavored honey. You can use um, dried herbs, spices, rinds of of oranges or lemons or limes, peppers, garlic, all kinds of things. But the recommendation is to use dried ingredients. You can use fresh ingredients and you know they'll tell you that fresh ingredients have more flavor, they do. But the problem is if you use fresh ingredients, you're actually introducing water into the honey because the, the material you're using is fresh. And if you do that, 
then your um, your honey can spoil. And if you so if you use fresh ingredients to make an infused or flavored honey, you would have to keep it in the refrigerator after making it. Um, you can use you know crushed herbs. You can use a whole stem of an herb if you want to. And what you do is just put a tablespoon or two in a jar of honey, mix it up really well, put the cap on, and let it sit for one to six weeks. And you can keep tasting it to see you know, when it's to your liking. Um, typically what you're supposed to do is turn, turn the jar over every time you think about it every day, turn it upside down and right side up, and that just keeps it mixing. And then when you're finished with and you're happy with the flavor, you can either strain it and take out what you put in it, or you can leave it in sometimes if you just use like a sprig of rosemary or something like that, it just adds a, a pretty look to it if you're giving it as a gift or whatever. Of course, if you leave something in like garlic cloves or whatever, it'll just keep getting stronger. So that might be something to think about. Um, using spices, cinnamon sticks and whole spices is really makes a, a nice honey also. Um, this is something that I think is really cool that I learned from uh, uh, Jane and, and Isaac Barnes down at Honey Run. They talked about this at a meeting that I was at. If you save your cappings wax separate from everything else and you know, you've strained it and you've drained it and you've set it in, in a, a honey strainer for days and days and days and let it drip, you, you would not believe how much honey is still left in those cappings. So if you take the, the cappings wax and you put it in a pot with no water, that's a little different than the way most of us, you know, render beeswax. You put no water in it and you melt it down just so everything is melted and everything is liquid. What you end up with in your pot is three layers. Now, when they were telling this, I'm thinking you can see these layers. You really can. It just all looks black down in the pot. But what happens is the, the top layer is... The, the bee guts and the debris, you know, the paint chips and the, the wood chips and things like that. And so you start scooping. I use a um, like a half cup measure measuring cup and you scoop shallowly and pour that off until you get all the lumpy stuff out. The next layer down is wax. So when I, I save it to use with my beeswax and I pour it through a strainer over a little butter bowl or something. So then you start shallowly scooping off that next layer. And as I do that, I, I stick my finger in it every now and then to make sure that it's still wax. And what it'll solidify on your finger pretty quickly. And then pretty soon you start getting something else. That bottom layer in that pot is honey. And it's called baker's honey because you've heated it. You've heated it to at least 144 degrees by, to get that beeswax to melt. So it's not raw honey anymore. However, it's a great thing to use when you bake. Then you're not using your good raw honey to bake with. And you can actually go on Amazon and find pints and quart jars of this. There is a market for baker's honey. The, the honey itself is a little dark and it's sort of caramelized, so it has a little bit of a different flavor. It's a little more like molasses in some ways, but it's, it's a great thing. And when we typically when we have a 10 frame uh, medium, I can get about eight quarts. No, I'm sorry, eight pounds of baker's honey out of the cappings wax. And then we have are sure we've gotten all the wax out. We've let it strain for days. There is still so much honey in there. And we, um, w once I get to that, that bottom layer and start scooping in its honey, I dump it in a bowl. And then oh, as it cools, there may be a little skim layer of wax left on the top and you just peel that off. And then what you have underneath is this dark caramelized honey that you can bottle up and use to bake with. So that's kind of a, a neat um, added uh, uh, little prize you get at the end. Now, the next... Um, uh, bee resource I'm going to talk about is bee propolis and this is really where our passion is because this is the most incredible stuff and I know y'all hate it we all hate it because it's so messy and sticky and it gets all over everything but it is so incredibly valuable there's probably more research on propolis on the National Institute of Health than there is anything else from the hive um, propolis is that tree resin but it does have some beeswax mixed in it. It does have some aromatic oils and it does have some pollen. And since the bees run it through their body, there are salivary secretions in it as well. 
And what it does for the trees is it protects the trees from getting bacteria, viruses, and fungus molds and yeast. And of course, it does the same thing for the beehive. There's about over 300 compounds in it. I mean, the scientists really haven't even identified them all yet. And many of those compounds are medicinally active. So in the hive, it protects, it disinfects, and it insulates. They also, in case intruders, if a mouse would get in the hive and the bees were still there, they will kill the mouse by stinging it to death, but they can't get the mouse out. And so they cover it in propolis and that keeps the, the mouse from decaying and ruining the hive. They can actually trace the use of propolis back to the ancient Egyptians and it was used in embalming. It's very possible that the pharaohs in the pyramids were embalmed in bee propolis. Um, it was used by Romans on, uh, as a tonic for battle and um, uh, as, as on wounds if they were hurt. Um, it kind of fell out of, of um, the writings and so forth during the Middle Ages, but it, you can kind of follow propolis all through folk medicine documents. Um, it kind of had a revival in the Renaissance. Now, since World War II, there's been an incredible amount of research on it. It's very popular in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe and Russia, and a lot of the research has been done there. And um, I mean, people just know about it. We, we have been told time and time again that um, from people in Europe that they buy it at the pharmacy in Europe. Every year at, when we do the bee pavilion with beekeepers at the state fair, somebody from Europe comes through and says, oh, we know what that is. We buy that at the pharmacy. We use it all the time. A year ago, a young couple uh, from the military that had been uh, uh, stationed in two different countries came through and she said, I have to tell you, in Europe, nobody uses antibiotics. Everybody uses B propolis when they're sick. Um, and again, you can go find over 70 years of research on the National Institute of Health if you really want to know what it can do. So research proven, propolis is antibiotic. It's antiviral. It's antifungal. It's antioxidant in your body, which means it, it helps gather free radicals from stress and it kind of has organ protective qualities. It's anti-inflammatory both inside and out, so it reduces swelling and redness and irritation. It's also analgesic, meaning it, it gives pain relief. It kind of numbs uh, to give pain relief, which is very useful when you use it. Uh, there have been clinical studies on all of these different things, and that means that these are human being studies. They've had studies on acne, eczema, psoriasis, shingles, rhinovirus, ear infections, upper respiratory, infer women with um, endo endometriosis, infertility, if they take 1,000 milligrams a day, can increase their chances of pregnancy from 20 to 60%. It's just amazing, some of the studies that they've done, um, upper re or urinary tract infections. They've, they've shown that um, propolis kills staph, strep, MRSA, E. coli, salmonella, stomach viruses, wart virus, shingles virus, shortens the common cold by two and a half times, athlete's foot, yeast infections, all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, we, we have tried it and uh, we can tell you that it really does work. <laughs> There's over... Um, about 85 different conditions. I started making a list as I was looking at research and I have found research on all these different health conditions um, and diseases that they have tested propolis on with some success. So systemic illnesses, whether it's strep throat or it's an upper respiratory infection, um, even things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, diabetes, it has organ protection qualities because of its, um, anti, or its um, antioxidant capabilities. It will um, help heal damaged skin and it does give pain relief um, in some cases. If you want to read research on and look any of this up, as I told you that NIH.gov, the National Institute of Health is a great resource. There's um, an AP therapy organization called um, AP, at aptherapy.org. The AP therapy blog spot um, address there, if you can go to that and sign up and get about a two or three times a week delivery into your email of one piece of research that they've chosen for the week to share on one of the seven hive resources. So it's not always just about propolis. And then we do have some links to research and have some research articles sorted by um, human studies, animal studies, petri dish studies, and things like that on, on our WordPress site if you're interested in um, 
just finding a place where a lot of it's at, at your fingertips. That's another place you can go. Now, we started trying this in about 2011. Um, our oldest daughter is severe asthmatic. She has anaphylactic allergies to foods and she had a new job and no health care. And she came home one, one day uh, with, with laryngitis. She'd had a sore throat when she got up and by three o'clock in the afternoon, she couldn't talk and it started settling in her chest. And usually with our three asthmatic chick kids, if they get a sniffle, it ends up an asthma attack in about three hours and about five days later, they have bronchitis or pneumonia. We, we had been reading about propolis and talking about it, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to try this. And you can do the, make the propolis oil in about 20 minutes on the stove. So I made some up, and I had her try it. She took three doses on Saturday, three more doses on Sunday, and spent Sunday in bed. And by Monday morning, all of her symptoms were gone, and she went back to work and never had the asthma attack, you know, and all of those other complications. And that has really been our experience about... Three weeks later, Pete Dotson had had walking pneumonia, had done a round of Z-Pack. And a week after that, we all went camping and he coughed all weekend long, kept everybody in the campground awake, I think. And I, when we got home, I said, I'm passing this bottle of propolis oil on to you. I want you to try it. And he did. And in three days, it was gone. So we were kind of hooked at that point. Um, so we've used it for, for colds, for asthma, for bronchitis. What we take is about 20 drops we, we don't, it's about half of a dropper full is, is what we take. And we make a 10% propolis oil, which I'm going to show you how to do. Um, we also use it for ear infections. We have a 30 year old son who still gets ear infections and he thought we were nuts. We were making snake oil, you know, according to him until he got his next ear infection. And I went down the road and said, bend over buddy, this is going in your ear, whether you like it or not. And the nice thing about it is that it gives almost instant pain relief. You know, you have a kid that's got a screaming ear infection in the middle of night. We, we made so many trips to Children's Hospital when he was a kid at 3 a.m. Uh, because of ear infections. And uh, it gives you pain relief right away. Uh, but he, he got rid of his ear infection in just a couple of days. Um, we use it for sinus. We mix it with a mild saline. And I use it almost every night, not just for infection, but for the congestion that you have. And then you get, you lay down in bed at night and start coughing. And if I use that, then that doesn't happen. Um, we also use it as a, 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 in our mouth. I get canker sores a lot and I use the propolis oil on canker sores. It kind of numbs them to get the pain relieved and then kind of helps them clear up in just a couple of days. Um, also great for topical things, blemishes. Um, we have um, Pete, Pete Dotson's mother has had a form of a recurring form of shingles and she started using the propolis oil on her skin, got instant pain relief on the rash. Then we got her taking it orally. She was getting a breakout every month. Um, she'd get rid of the rash in two days and then we got her taking it orally. And over a period of about a year, she got longer and longer periods of wellness in between. And now she's at the point where she doesn't break out anymore. Um, but she said the minute she forgets taking, uh, forgets to take it for a couple of days, the tingle on her skin comes back where the rash breaks out. And so she knows she's got to keep up with it. Um, it'll also lighten up age spots. Um, it will heal wounds. Um, give you give some people you know inflammation or uh, reducing inflammation and joint pain we've had people that will massage the oil into their hands their arthritic hands and get pain relief in five minutes that happens for Lori and Lori Dotson it does not happen for Steve or I so like like any kind of medicinal thing it's different for everybody so it's just something you have to see if it how it um works for you. There's also research on pets and farm animals, believe it or not, and we do use it on our pets. Uh, we had this young couple buy it for their chickens that had pecked each other, so they had to send us their before and after pictures, but we've used it on um, dog ear infections. Ear, the oil will kill ear mites um, on their hot spots. If they're sick, we put it in their food or their water. Um, you know, rub it into, Lori uses it, she has a, um, her son's little cockapoo that's gotten quite old and he has back problems and she massages the oil into his back legs to give him some pain relief. So it actually does work for the animals and this is how we use it. We use um, propolis oil or tincture. The tincture is always by definition an alcohol. So you, you make it either way and I'm going to show you both ways. Um, and there's, there's no 
they're both the same strength. It's just a matter of preference. If you don't like alcohol and you don't want to give alcohol to kids, you make the oil. If you want something that'll mix in a drink, you make it in alcohol and you can hide it in a drink if you want. Um, but we use about a half a dropper full. Um, and some of us take it preventatively and some of us only use it when we're sick. My husband has asthma and he's a smoker. And for many, many, many years, he would be sick from September to March every year with about six rounds of bronchitis or pneumonia. He started taking propolis every day, eight years ago, half a dropper pool. And he has only had bronchitis twice in eight years since he's been taking it. He also had COVID in April and we were absolutely terrified that he was really going to be very sick uh, with it because he has six risk factors from heart stents, asthma, COPD, diabetes, over 65, and he was hardly sick at all. Um, and we, we really feel like maybe that is why. Um, if we're sick, we take it three times a day um, until the symptoms are gone. And honestly, we have uh, four generations of our families taking propolis regularly and nobody's been sick longer than about two days. So it's been quite a quite a wonderful thing for our family. This is kind of a, a mild thing about what it can do for skin. This was somebody that was putting it on eczema and just took a couple days to really start drying that up. Um, and I'm going to show you some other things. I found a, a, a very interesting piece of research on NIH.gov that was done in 1972 in Poland. This doctor, Dr. Stan Scheller, had 100 patients with hard to heal wounds. And the, the really cool thing is the entire study is there. Sometimes you only see the abstract, but this whole entire study is there. It tells where they got the propolis, how they collected it, how they cleaned it, how strong they made the ointments, how many times they changed the dressing on the wounds, et cetera. And um, he had a tremendous success. And I'm going to show you some of the results he had. And these aren't too bad. There are some quite, whoops, there are some that are quite more uh, dramatic than these. But got the before and after with the baby with the burns on its face. And then there's hardly even scarring left um, on, on the burns. And the same thing for the hands. But they have some, he has some photos of bed sores to the bone and these deep tissue ulcers. Uh, just amazing. This is a chart that's in, in his um, report. And basically it tells that, what is it? Six, seven different, seven different kinds of injuries from burns to infected surgical incisions and how, how many people there were, how long they'd had the illness. And if you look at the, that yellow highlighted, some of these people that he treated had these deep tissue ulcers that diabetics and the elderly get. Some have had them for 30 years unhealed. And his overall success rate was about 80, I think it says 85%. I can't see my percentage because the my picture's in front of it, 87. But anyway, um, just tremendous um, success with the way that he treated these wounds. And he used two and a half percent propolis ointment. That's it. Now we started collecting our own pictures to show you. So if you don't like looking at wounds, don't look at the next few slides. I'll let you know when it's safe to look again. So this first one was a friend of Lori's from, from high school that she was following on Facebook. And he was complaining that he'd had this surgery on his elbow. It's now two months old and the doctors cannot get this to heal. It's about two inches long and he's using all his sick leave up. He's a police officer. He can't go back to work because this wound is still open and weeping. So Lori took pity on him and sent him a, a tube of bee rescue cream that's two and a half percent propolis. And in five days, he got this wound to close up. He kept taking pictures for us and this is what it looked like after a month. And he said he kept using it on that scar and got the scar down to just a little teeny line that you can hardly see. Now the next one is a little more dramatic, but it's kind of amazing. Um, our daughter's a nurse and she was doing home health care with a paraplegic and he had a seven-year-old bed sore the size of a dinner plate on his back that she was able to get healed over with the propolis cream. She went on to a new job and a couple of months later, the dad called and asked for more. So she went over to take some to him and she gets there and it's not for the son. Dad has fallen over his running lawnmower and he's gashed his leg open 
and he's been to the emergency room and had 30 some stitches and it's now been three weeks and it's not doing very well. That's what it looked like. Sarah threw a fit and said, you know, Larry, you have got to go to the hospital. That is gangrenous and infected. You're going to lose your leg. Go to the hospital. Well, he refused and he's going to use that B cream and he's going to prove to her that it can be done. This is what it looked like one week later. His wife put it on twice a day and pressed it and, and covered it. Now, what Sarah said is the middle is not infection left. The middle is called sloth and it's the soft scab starting to form from underneath um, until it you know, gets to the surface and scabs over. But the other thing I think is interesting is look at, look at his leg around it. You know, he's got that scaly red diabetic skin and even that's looking better. So that's one week. And that's 10 weeks. Never went to the hospital. My daughter said, had he gone to the hospital, they would have put him on IV antibiotics. They would have debrided the wound and that wouldn't have felt very good. <laughs> they would have put in a wound vac and eventually have to do a skin graft. And then he would have two wounds that would have to heal. So the propolis did this instead, two and a half percent. These are some things that you can do with propolis um, if you ever decide you want to collect it, at least do it for your own family. But you can um, grind it up if it's frozen. You can grind it up in a dedicated uh, coffee grinder and it will grind into little teeny um, powder, sort of. Um, you can make tinctures in alcohol or infusions in other solvents. Um, you can make cough syrup, you can put it in gum, and you can actually find these things, gum, toothpaste. Uh, the toothpaste there on the left is actually the house brand of Trader Joe's, and it is a propolis toothpaste. Uh, you can do nose drops, you can make cough drops. In Mexico, where our daughter lived for a while, they make suckers for kids when they're sick and they have propolis in them, so they just suck on a sucker to get this natural medicine down, down while they're sick. Um, you can also put propolis, um, you, you make the, the tincture of the oil and then use that as an ingredient in other things, skin creams and scrubs for wound care. You can put it in shaving soap, aftershave, beard, beard wax, shampoo and conditioner, and all kinds of things you can do with it. Um, these are some things you can do for your house. You can make furniture polish with it. You can make leather cleaner or conditioner with it. Um, and the, the benefit of having the propolis in it is that it kills the germs. So one of the reasons that your leather goods like belts or work shoes or whatever smell is from the germs from our skin and the propolis kills that. Um, propolis, you can make varnish with it. Actually, varnish is made with tree resin and they, the, the, the legend is that the Stradivarius violins were actually varnished with propolis varnish. Um, you can make wax, you can use it as a cleaning solution, mixing it with water. They are actually doing research right now on using it as a salad green wash for salad greens in the grocery store that get salmonella and E. coli because it kills both. So that's another thing you know, that they're looking at. So I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can do with propolis. And if you want to, I think, are you taping this, Jamie? Yeah. You taping this? Yes, ma'am. They can so they can see this later if they don't have time to write it down. If you want to make tincture, use alcohol. It has to be 75 proof. Doesn't matter what kind it is. It can be, you know, vodka. It can be brandy. It can be bourbon. Whatever you want, um, as long as it's 75 proof or higher, you can actually make tincture up to 50 percent strength because alcohol is a good solvent for things that are not water based. Now, what I'm finding in research is most of the topical uses or the uses for uh, germs, for bacteria, viruses, and fungus, only need two to four percent. But, and I've been doing some, some more research and really looking at doses for things that are um, more using the propolis as antioxidant effect. And it looks like some of those things, um, if you know, for diabetics, for heart protection, and things like that, are using anywhere from 900 to 1500 milligrams a day. And at that point, then it would be benefit, beneficial to make a stronger solution. Um, so you do this by weight, not by volume. So you have to get the kitchen, the little kitchen scale out and weigh you know, the propolis. So if you wanted to do a 5% solution, it would be, you know, if you had 60, 60 milligrams of propolis, you'd multiply that by 19 for your, the weight of your alcohol. 
Um, we do it in, in two quart mason jars. And one of the tricks we learned um, early on, if you put the propolis right in the jar, you'll never get it out again because it's gonna stick to the bottom. Uh, we started using these little voil bags and when we make big batches of it, we use a paint strainer. If you put the propolis in a, a porous bag, then when you're finished um, infusing it, you can just take the propolis out by taking the whole bag out. Um, so what you do is you put, you know, your one part propolis, 19 parts alcohol in a jar, shake it up and put it in a dark place like a cupboard or whatever. And then every day when you think about it, take it out and shake it up again. Now it will not all dissolve. Um, there will be a residue of propolis left. Uh, so you, you do want to pull that out at the end and they say, you know, check it. And it takes about three weeks. They say when it makes your tongue numb, then it's ready. It'll get kind of a dark brown. Um, you can also reuse the propolis. Um, one of the things I learned in that FAO.org booklet is that if you want to know if the propolis is still viable, maybe you've got a bucket of it that's been sitting out in the garage for five years. If you take a, a teaspoon of the propolis and put it in a cup of milk and let it sit on the counter for four days, if the milk doesn't spoil, then the propolis is still active. So it's killed those germs that make it spoil. So you can do the same thing with the propolis that you've already used and use it again. Um, again, three weeks, shake it every day. If, you're, if your tongue is numb, then it's ready. Um, strain it or pull the bag out if you put it in a bag. It's really best if you store it in a dark bottle. If you don't want to go to the trouble of buying the, the little dark medicinal bottles. You just keep it in a cupboard or something. You can make it with other solvents. You can make it with glycerin. You can make it with water. You can even use um, polypropylene, things like that if it's just topical. But really, alcohol is probably the best solvent um, in, in pulling out the, the most medicinally active parts of it. Some people swear by water, but according to that research, the research and the, um, the booklet on FAO.org, alcohol is really the better thing to use. Now we also make it in, in oil. And the reason we do that is just for people's preference. And also, if you want to use it on your skin, the oil is going to be a lot more comfortable than putting alcohol on cuts and things like that. Um, we use olive oil because it has a long shelf life. So you just, you know, in choosing the oil, it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it's going to last on the shelf. You don't want to use something that has only, you know, four or six month shelf life. You can only make up to 10% in the oil. The oil will not infuse any more than that. So that's the only limitation. Now you do have to use heat to make the propolis oil. Um, so, you know, weigh the, weigh the propolis, weigh the oil, put it in a jar with a lid, and then put it in a pot on the stove filled with water. Now the only problem with doing it on the stove is that no matter whether you have gas or electric, stove, it's hard to heat and hold on a burner on the stove. We um, invested in, a indu in an induction burner, and that, that's the kind where the pot has to be um, attracted to a magnet, and these, these canning pots will do it. And we do it in the induction burner, on the induction burner, because it can be set to a temperature. If you don't want to do an induction, invest in an induction burner, um, another thing that you could do if you have a fry daddy, you could make your propolis in shorter mason jars, fill the fry daddy with water, put the mason jars in the fry daddy, and then the fry daddy has a thermostat on it and you can set it to, you don't wanna heat it above 120 degrees. I just got a phone call from a friend of mine that lives up by Lake Erie and she was wondering why her oil got thick, almost like a gel. And we're wondering if maybe she overheated it because overheating oils and, and even beeswax does change the texture of it. But you keep it at 120. Um, at 10 minutes, turn it upside down. Turn the jars upside down so you're heating, you know, making sure it's getting mixed and heating all of it. You want the water to be up to the level of the oil in the jar. You don't want to just have two inches of oil and only heat the bottom of the oil. Um, at 20 minutes, remove the jars and let them cool. And again, if you want to put it in dark containers, you can do that. Um, but that's, that's how you make the oil and it's easy and you can do it in 20 minutes if you've got somebody sick in your house. So now the one thing I want to warn you about, we've, we've been through the mill with, with ODA and FDA. Um, propolis is considered, if you're taking it orally, it is considered a dietary supplement. And under the law, Dietary supplements cannot be made at your home 
they have to be made in an FDA and then ODA certified production facility. And there are only two that I know of in the state of Ohio. One is in Athens, it's called ACENET, and the other one is up north somewhere, and I don't, I don't even know for sure where it is. There is one at OSU, but the students use it so much that most, most of the time the public can't get into that one. Um, you can make it for your family all you want. You just can't sell it unless you do it under the law um, anywhere in, in the United States. As a, if you put it in creams and balms, it's considered a cosmetic. Now, the FDA website says you can make cosmetic products in your home or salon. We got in trouble with ODA and they told us, no, you can't in Ohio. But we all know thousands of people that are making lip balms and creams and selling them at festivals and farm markets and nobody's saying a word. So we, you know, we have to follow the law because we were told, but um, it is considered cosmetic. The only thing you have to be careful is you cannot put anything on any label of any kind saying what it really can do. You can't make any medical claims or anything like that, or they will come after you because that's, considered, you know, selling medicine without a license. So can't do that. I'm going to move on to pollen and um, talk a little bit about why this is, is valuable and important. Um, pollen is, of course, the male seed of the flowers and it's food for the, the young bees. It's actually 40% protein. If you weighed out a pollen to equal the weight of a steak, the pollen would actually have more protein in it. It's also full of vitamins and minerals and um, antioxidants, all kinds of things. Um, it actually um, is, is nutrient dense and it can regulate you know, intestinal function. It can increase um, white blood cells and hemoglobin. It can help normalize triglycerides. Um, it, it's, it is a, a valuable nutritional um, product. It also has some antibacterial um, uh, effects it can inhibit harmful bacteria a lot of time a lot of, of um, other countries they use it as an adjunct treatment to chemotherapy as they do with with propolis as well they have people taking it along with their chemo and radiation um, they some of the research has shown that it has delayed or prevented cancerous tumors in mice now, we all talk about the hay fever remedy that pollen and, and local honey are and I will tell you that there is not a lot of research to support either of those, either the honey or the pollen. And there probably never will be because it's a natural product and the pharmaceutical companies aren't gonna make lots of money doing research on those things. Um, there are, there's tons and tons and tons of anecdotal um, promotion that honey and, and pollen help with allergies. But the thing that you have to think about is that they believe that it sort of works like an allergy shot where it's exposing you to the, that thing you're allergic to and you're supposed to start taking the pollen or the honey ahead of the season that you have problems with your allergies in. But if you think about this, let's say you're allergic to goldenrod. Goldenrod is blooming right now. So take, if you were taking honey six weeks ago to get started for goldenrod season and you were using your spring or summer honey, that honey doesn't have any goldenrod pollen in it. And when you buy pollen, it's never sorted or labeled as to what season it was collected or even what plants it came from. So you really don't have any way of knowing. What you would really need to do, if it works the way they think it works, is you would need last year's fall honey that would have goldenrod pollen in it to help you get ready for the the goldenrod season. So, you know, a lot of people swear by it. There just isn't probably ever going to be a lot of research to support that. Um, some things you can do with pollen if you want to collect it. Um, you can grind it up and put it in, in uh, capsules. And again, you got to use a, a coffee grinder. A food processor will not grind pollen. Um, you, can, you can use it in smoothies, in in energy bites or uncooked foods, um, little energy bites and peanut butter bites and things like that. It can also be used as skin scrub. Um, the one thing I will tell you, um, pollen has a very hard coat on it and it's very hard for our body to digest it. Our body can digest a little bit of it, but you really aren't getting the full benefit of the pollen unless you grind it up first or 
make bee bread with it. And that's what the bees do. The bees can't digest it any better than we can. So they layer it with honey in the cells and the honey breaks down the hard coat on the pollen uh, and makes it the, the nutrients in it available then to their bodies and to ours. So this is what, what bee bread looks kind of from a side view. I've read that it's called bee bread because it looks like slices of bread from the side like this. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody really knows where that name came from. But um, again, there's a fermentation process that happens between the honey and the pollen and it breaks down the hard coat. You can do this outside the hive. Now, purists will argue and say, well, this isn't really bee bread, but you know, they write about it in bee culture and call it bee bread this way. So um, you can make it outside the hive. There are recipes in that fao.org booklet. The only thing about the recipes in there is um, they have you add probiotics to it, which I think maybe is a substitute for the, the bee enzymes and from their body, but they also have you add water. And I, I just don't know if that's a good idea because when you add water to honey, then you're setting up a chance for, the, for it to either spoil or to grow botulism. I, don't, I just don't think that's a good idea. We don't do that. Um, but you can make it outside the hive. The interesting thing is that we have found that ounce for ounce, it is equivalent to runners and athletes' energy gels. They're, you're getting the same amount of carbs for energy, plus you're getting protein and all the nutrients. Um, we have friends that use it in races. We have one guy that runs 100-mile ultramarathons. Why, I don't know. But he puts four ounces of bee bread in his water when he races. And he said he, he gets a really nice long... Um, boost of energy instead of the high and the crash every 30 minutes that you get with um, the high fructose corn syrup and caffeine energy gels that athletes use. So um, the athlete friends and family members that we have really like it for, for that purpose. And this is how you do it. I'm going to show you how. Um, you can make bee bread pretty much in any ratio you want. Uh, of course, the more pollen you put in, the thicker it will be. And pollen has kind of a very grainy taste to me. It sort of tastes a lot like wheat germ. It's not my favorite flavor. So of course, the more pollen you put in, the more grainy it's going to taste, but you can flavor it. Um, so one to two, one to four, one to eight, however you want to want to do that. And you simply um, mix it in a jar. And you have to, if you're going to use a, a full jar of honey, you're going to have to dump some of it out to get the pollen in. But um, you put it in a jar, mix it well, and then set it in a warm, dark place for two to six weeks. And again, turning it over, flipping it up and down every couple of days to keep it mixing. The, po the pollen kind of floats to the top. So you have to kind of keep it mixing. And over that period of time, the honey will break the, the pollen down. And then when you eat it, you will get all the benefits of the pollen as well. Um, so we use it in coffee or tea. You can put it in smoothies or energy bars, things that aren't cooked. It's great on toast or ice cream. We actually have friends that keep a bottle of um, bee bread in their drawer at work. And when they start nodding off about three o'clock in the afternoon, they squirt a, a spoonful of it in their mouth. We had a lady one time tell us that she keeps a bottle in her car. She travels a lot. When she starts nodding off at the wheel, she takes a spoonful of bee bread. Um, it really does perk you up. I, it, it doesn't make you jittery like caffeine does, but just in 10 or 15 minutes, you suddenly realize that you're not kind of nodding off and your eyelids don't feel heavy. And then we have athlete friends and family members that use it before, during, or after their workouts. All righty. Now, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to pr proceed on to beeswax real quick. I think we've got time for that, and then we'll see. Um, I knew this was going to be long and we might not get to, to everything. So we'll see how it goes, if that's okay. Jamie, does that sound all right? He's not talking. Good, Jamie. <laughs> okay. So, um, just... No, just you're good. Okay. Um, beeswax actually has 284 compounds and 48 of them are actually part of the smell that it has. Um, it comes from their wax glands underneath their body. And I didn't know this until recently that they only do it at a certain age, which is kind of interesting. And um, they chew it and mold it into shape with their mouth and their, their front leg tools. Um, there's many, many uses for it um, from, from, you know, surface protection on your skin, on leather, on wood, all kinds of things. Um, 
and also for candles. Um, the nice thing about candles with beeswax is that it has natural aroma. It doesn't typically make people that are asthmatic or sensitive to smells have an asthma attack when you light it. And if you wick it correctly and you keep the wick cut to one quarter inch, it will not smoke and, and soot. You won't have that black spot on the ceiling of your room when you burn it. And they also last a long time. They burn, um, they, they burn hot, so they, they have to have a lot of heat and they last a while. Now, there is a, a myth out there, and I've heard this and read this on so many websites about beeswax candles cleaning the air. Well, I started looking to see if I could prove that, if there was any research on it. And the only research that I found was a study where they burned several different things. They burned paraffin, they burned soy, they burned beeswax. And what they found is that every single one of them put off the same chemicals, no matter what the substance was, and not at toxic levels in a room. Now, what they say about beeswax cleaning mirror, and if you Google it and look it up, you'll read this over and over and over again. They say that it makes negative ions when you burn the beeswax and that goes out into the air and it captures the positive ions in the germs and dust particles and matches up with them and they drop to the ground. Well, I finally did find a page where a gentleman who was an electrical engineer said, I'm an electrical engineer and when you burn a candle, no, it does not make negative ions. That's a bunch of nonsense. So I really believe that that's an urban myth and it really doesn't clean the air, but see if you can find the proof. I could, um, th these are some different things that you can do with the beeswax. Once you've rendered it and cleaned it, you can put it in skincare and hair care. Beeswax is a great substitute for petroleum products. You know, if you look at the things that we buy at the grocery store to put on our skin, it's kind of shocking when you start reading labels. And so much of, of you know, skin creams and things like that are made with petroleum products. Um, so beeswax is that thickener and substitute and, and surface protection um, for skin, for hair. You can make leather and wood care products with it. You can put it in soap. Now, if you do put it in soap, one of the things that's kind of interesting is it makes the soap softer, not harder which is kind of odd because beeswax is so hard. You can make candles with it and there's hundreds of household uses. You can Google it and find you know, lists of hundreds of things you can do. I keep a, a piece of beeswax beside my sewing machine and I, I wax thread when I'm trying to uh, thread needles and things like that. You can you know, uh, resurface wooden bowls, cutting boards, things like that. You can dip, uh, gardening tools in it to keep them from rusting, just all kinds of things that you can do. Now, some hints for working with beeswax. We used to um, melt beeswax. Now, this is, this is after it's rendered. You know, we render it in an old pot over a, 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 bur a burner that we use in the garage. I don't, it, you know, we've done it in the kitchen and then use great beeswax off the kitchen floor for months afterwards. So we usually render our beeswax outside in an old you know yard sale pot and with with water in it and then you dump the whole thing once it's melted into a pickle bucket through a strainer and the beeswax floats to the top and melts into a, a disc but once once the beeswax has been rendered and you're working with clean beeswax to make something we use a fry daddy and the reason is the, the crock pot takes forever to heat up. And when we've used crock pot before, we have all the other ingredients ready and we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the beeswax to melt in the crock pot. The other thing that happens is I have an old crock pot that has two, two settings, low and high. And even on low, eventually the crock pot gets too hot and the, the wax starts to smoke. And when it starts smoking, then you're destroying properties and you're changing the texture of it. Um, with the, the Fry Daddy, there's a ther on many of the models, there's a thermostat. And if you buy one with a thermostat, you can set it right below, you know, right at low, and it won't ever get above 140 or 150 degrees. So I set it just so the beeswax starts to melt and leave it there. Now, you know, a lot of times on most places, it'll tell you to, to melt your beeswax over um, a double burner. The problem with that is it takes forever to melt. And really, if you look at the flash point versus the melting point, the melting point of beeswax is 144 to 147. The flash point where it starts a fire is 400 degrees. 
So if you're careful and you don't ever walk away from it, it, it's very unlikely that you would ever have it flash on you if you're only heating it to around 140. I think when you're making candles, if you're doing candles in two pours, you do the first pour at 144 and then you heat it up to about 180 for the second pour so that it sticks. That's still way far away from 400 degrees. So we do not use a double burner. And we've also found that the best strainer for that final strain before you put it in a product or make it can't with make a candle with it is cotton knit material old t-shirts and things like that really strain out the last little teeny tiny fine particles um, the other thing that we, what we used to do when we were cleaning up our utensils and stuff after melting beeswax was that i would fill the pot and put all the utensils in it fill it with boiling with water and heat it up to boiling and then i would put a roll paper towels under one arm and go out the back door with this pot of boiling water in my hands and find a patch of weeds or something to dump it on and then real quick wipe everything out with the paper towels. There's an easier way now. We, the heat gun is your friend. Um, when I make a mess with beeswax, I just melt it down with the heat gun and wipe it up as it's melted and that really does the trick. So I just use the heat gun and paper towels to clean up the mess. Um, Amy, what do you think? Shall I quit here or, or go on? Uh, you're good. You're still good. Everybody's All right. kind well, of sticking we'll around. See if we can get through this and, and, uh, cause these are kind of interesting things. Um, I started looking at Royal jelly and I have seen Royal jelly at conferences and even bought some. And I have to tell you, it is the most disgusting stuff I've ever tasted, <laughs> but, um, it is, Something that they make in the hive. Now, the, the thing about royal jelly is that it is not stored in the hive. It is only found in the queen cups. Um, it is full of water, proteins, sugar, fats, vitamins, salt, salts, and it's for the development of the queen bees. All the bees get a little bit of it, but the queen bee gets it all. Now, the fact that it's not, not stored in the hive is an issue. Um, it's only in the queen cells. It's very fragile. If you extract it and you save it, it has to be kept frozen. It will only last one week in the refrigerator. It can be freeze dried, but it does lose potency. Um, at one point in time, it was very popular in a, a women's facial cream about 20 years ago called Jaffra. And I really question whether or not it really has any efficacy in that because it doesn't keep its potency very long and it tastes awful it's very bitter and it has the consistency of uncooked egg whites it's disgusting <laughs> so use at your own risk um, there is research on it and uh, several in the last five years have shown that it reduces total cholesterol and LDL it can improve your serum glucose and type 2 diabetics but the big issue of that it had skin benefiting and skin rejuvenating effects and that was the big deal about 20 years ago. There are no studies that prove that. And in my opinion, there are other bee resources that work better. I mean, propolis has so many more beneficial medicinal properties. I don't know why you would bother <laughs> harvesting royal jelly. You can. Um, it's very tedious. In order to, to harvest it, you have to raise queens halfway. And... Um, they, they make the, have them make the queen cups, put an egg in, make a queen cup. When they start filling it with royal jelly, then if you want to harvest the royal jelly, you destroy the queen cups. Um, but you either suction it out one at a time like this and, you know, takes hours and hours. Or what they do in China is they crush all of these queen cells and then filter the wax out. Um, most of the, the royal jelly that you buy here in this country is from China. And that would be suspect number one, because we have no idea what they've used on their bees, what they're using on their crops. It takes 10 to 20 cells to make one ounce of royal jelly. Um, and uh, really, I think most, most of the companies that sell it do actually say and it, it's coming from China. And they have to ship it frozen to get here. Um, you can take it orally, and as I said, it's really awful, um, either in liquid form or, or freeze-dried, and it is in some skin creams. Um, you can put it on your skin raw. You can use skin creams that have royal jelly in it. 
But again, I, I think there are, are better hive resources than royal jelly to mess with since it's, you know, you're, you're kind of disrupting the whole beekeeping process by, by harvesting the royal jelly. Um, so that's, that's short and sweet. Now bee venom is something that we've gotten kind of interested in. And we, Lori and I went to the um, AP therapy conference in Providence, Rhode Island about three falls ago, and it was very, very interesting. But again, if you want to do bee venom therapy, you got to be miserable <laughs> in order to want to sting yourself. Um, it actually goes way back to ancient Greece and China. There's lots of research on it on NIH.gov. Um, in this country, the only way to get bee venom therapy is to do it with bees. In some countries, they actually collect the venom. I'm going to show you how that's done. And you can actually get measured injections of bee venom in other countries, but not here. And it's also used um, in topical forms as well. Um, it has uh, melatonin in it and peptides that are good for you know, our bodies. And I'm gonna show you what happens when you do this. What happens with bee venom is you know, there's that initial allergic response and inflammation response that our body has to it. But once that goes away, the bee venom actually activates the adrenal glands in your body and it, for, it makes their adrenal glands release sort of self-healing um, um, chemicals in our body. So it can reduce inflammation, it can change your immune response, it can improve the stress response and do things with the stress hormones, and it actually has been proven to inhibit tumor growth. Um, there's been a lot of research on um, arthritis pain from, for both kinds of arthritis, on allergies, on asthma, on eczema, and um, showing, showing success with bee venom therapy. Also on these immune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and MS. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen some of the pictures of people getting multiple, you know, 15, 20, 25 stings for MS and people getting improvement of their symptoms. Um, so that is being done. Um, also for Lyme disease, um, at, at this conference, I talked to a young girl about 20, 25, who had Lyme disease. And the problem with Lyme disease, Lyme, the Lyme disease gets a biofilm around it so that most of the traditional medications cannot penetrate that biofilm to kill the Lyme germ. And what it does is affect your immune system so that you get all these other infections that you wouldn't normally get if you didn't have Lyme disease. So it's the secondary infections and complications that most people suffer from. Um, but this young girl had Lyme disease and she had lost her ability to walk she had started, um, she had gone blind in one eye and started having daily seizures all as a result of the Lyme disease. She had started bee venom therapy and in six months time, they were stinging down the, between the vertebrae down both sides of her spine and that's where all the nerve um, roots are. Within six months, she had all of her faculties back and her Lyme, uh, her, her germ load for the Lyme disease was almost zero. So that's pretty amazing. Um, also for neurological disorders like Parkinson's, ALS, and even Alzheimer's, they're finding people can, um, you know, reduce the symptoms and things like that with the bee venom therapy. Um, and we've tried it and we do it. Um, this is the way it's actually collected. You can actually buy these electrified platforms. Um, it, to do six hives, it would cost about $1,000. And it's a little glass platform if you look at the picture on the right, that you put it at the entrance at the landing board and the bees land and walk across it and it gives a little electrical shock and they sting the glass with their stinger and it deposits venom. Then when you're done, you leave it on for you know a couple of hours or whatever. Uh, if you look, look in the lower left, they, you scrape this dried venom off little teeny tiny amounts. It takes a million stings in 20 hours to get one gram of venom. Now a gram weighs what a small paper clip weighs. So to get just that much, that's how many stings it would take. So it's kind of a labor intensive, but people do, you know, ha collect this from their hives and they sell it to companies that in this country, they put it in skin cream. It can't be metered doses but it is found in some skin creams. Um, if you wanted to do bee venom therapy to yourself, you use these special tweezers that you can buy on Amazon. They're about, 
I don't know, eight inches long and they're reverse tweezers. When you pinch them, they open at the end and then you let go and they grab. You get a jar of bees, bring them in the house, get your, make, make sure you have your first aid kit ready uh, with Benadryl and ice pack. And if, if you are lucky enough to be able to get an epinephrine pen, an EpiPen, you have that too. Um, we found that icing before and after helps. And I think that little picture in the, let me, I've got my stuff printed off because I can't see part of my screen here. Um, the little picture on the bottom right, there is a company called Ferris Apiaries in North Carolina that sells bees for venom therapy year round if you can't get your own bees and they come in this little cage, there's like 60 bees in the little cage and they ship them to you. And that's the way a lot of people get them that aren't beekeepers if they wanna do bee venom therapy. Um, if you ever would do this to someone else, you would make want to make sure that you have them sign a waiver form. Really the best way to do this, if you ever wanted to, somebody else wanted to have bee venom therapy would be to teach them how to do it themselves or teach a family member how to do it to them because there is a big liability issue. Most of the people that we met that actually practice bee venom therapy are AP or are, um, acupuncturists and they've kind of added this to their repertoire but what you do is you grab you grab you, you put your tweezers down in that jar and you chase the bees around with the tweezers open and then when you kind of get close to one you let go and and hope it grabs the abdomen of the bee now when you pull the bee out and put it on your skin wherever you touch their butt down on your skin they will sting you and what you're supposed to do is start with a test sting but of course, we've all been stung before and we know what happens. So that probably wouldn't be necessary if you were doing it to yourself. But if you're doing it to somebody else, it doesn't typically get stung all the time. You want to do a testing and they recommend you do it on, on the love handles around the waist where there's some tissue there. Um, they used to tell people to do it on the wrist. Well, there's not enough tissue there on the wrist and your hand will swell and be huge. That's not a good idea. But to do a testing, you just sting and then get the stinger out. And you don't want to, when the stinger, ends up in your skin, the, the venom sac is attached. And if you grab that with your fingers to pull it out, you're going to squeeze that venom sac and just inject all that venom into your skin. That's why they tell you to scrape it off with a credit card or your fingernail or something like that. So you're not overdosing yourself on venom. Um, we, we typically ice first if we're, if we're doing it. Um, sting, and there's two schools of thought. Stinging at the pain site um, is actually a man called, um, I'm going to have trouble thinking of his name now, Mar Charles Moraz was, is considered the father of American venom therapy. He was a beekeeper in New York back at the beginning of the century, and um, his recommendation is just sting where it hurts. Um, acupuncture, or yeah, acupuncturists usually will sting at the acupuncture site for where it hurts, or if you have like chronic pain or whatever, they'll sting down the, the spinal column. And you leave the venom sac in to pump. Now you have to know what your own reaction is. When I first started getting bee stings, I would get a really big reaction. And if I left that venom sac in for 15 minutes, I would have an enormous reaction. So I would start out with like one or two minutes and that's all. So you can, you can decide, you know, how long you want to leave it in. And it, it also depends on where it is. I had a, I was a volunteer at a at a conference and let somebody sting me. And I, I had nerve pain on the top of my foot and I had her sting me there. Well, I left it in and that wasn't very smart because there's no, there's no, you know, tissue or there's no uh, meat under the skin on the top of your foot. And my foot swelled and it was hot and sore and then it itched like crazy. So it would have been better if I hadn't left it in that long. You just kind of have to know what your reaction is going to be. So icing before and after does help. It also helps to put propolis oil or tincture on it afterwards. You do not want to take Benadryl because that stops that whole process and then that prevents the, the venom sting from doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and the number of stings and the length of the treatment varies on what you're stinging for. My husband can sting right here on, on the fleshy part between his thumb and his first finger and get rid of all the arthritis pain in his hand for about a month with one sting. Um, but if you're, if you're dealing with something chronic, um, you might have to have a, mo a month or two, or it might need to be, you know, six months, or it might need to be every month, you know, 
five stings every month for the rest of your life or whatever. It just depends. Um, they say to start off with one and then, you know, every couple of days, you, you do it every other day or every third day, uh, build up if you, if you feel like you need to. I get bursitis in my shoulder and I will do one to three stings across the top of my shoulder. And usually if I just do it once, I'll get some relief for quite quite a few months. You can also pull the stinger out of the bee with your tweezers and and take the the, the stinger and just do many, like if you had, they were going to do a, a mole on, on my face and you just kind of poke it around the, the something. And that way you're not getting the full sting, um, but you're, you're kind of spreading it around. And that's a way to, another way to do it on, on places that are sensitive. Oh, we've actually done it, you know, for arthritis, for bursitis in my shoulder. Uh, Pete Dotson's done it for back pain. Lori had a big mole on the back of her neck that she stung every other day for about a week and got the mole completely shriveled up and fell off. We know people that have stung their knees for when you have bad knees. Uh, we have had, and I will tell you this, Lori, Lori was stinging a friend of a friend who was a massage therapist and she was starting to have trouble with her hands hurting. And that's kind of a problem when you use your hands for your job. So she was getting bee stings and she got bee stings all summer long. And one day she came over to get them and I was over visiting at Lori's and she had an allergic reaction and we had to call the squad and she had to go to the emergency room. So it can happen. You know, we, I'm sure we all know people that have had gotten a sudden allergy to bee stings, even though they've been stung numerous times and just all of a sudden something goes haywire. So that's the thing, you know, with stinging other people is that it becomes a liability issue if you're doing that. These are two great resources that I found if you want to, you know, try out the bee venom. The Health and the Honey Bee is the Charles Mraz um, book, and it's very um, conversational, and he kind of tells stories about his, his clients, and he did work with doctors at Johns Hopkins and, and some neat things, uh, but he was just a, a beekeeper. Um, the other book is called Acupuncture Points Quick Guide, and it's really nice because, you know, if you start looking at acupuncture stuff, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of acupuncture points on the body. This is a very abbreviated version that does one meridian at a time, and it'll show you maybe five to 10 of the most important spots on that particular site and what each of them is for. So I went through it with two different colors of highlighter, one for my, my issues and one for my husband's, and highlighted places that might help with the chronic pain I have or things like that. And then you, if, you're, if you're using acupuncture points, sometimes they'll say do uh, split your body into thirds and do the top third one day and then two days later do the middle third and two days later do the bottom third, something like that. Um, so it just, it's just um, different schools of thought and you just have to kind of experiment and see what works best for you. That is all I have. And um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain those at this point. All right. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Yep. I'm going to launch a poll, and the poll is part for uh, the live session and also for OSBA, and we're kind of tracking what your guys' feedback is. I've also launched a poll on the chat. So please go to the Survey Monkey, and we're asking you guys to give us feedback, and those are the presenters that we're looking for. Um, the pollinators is after this. We're talking to Mike Reeder. He's going to be for OPI, Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, and he's from Presence Forever. He's the program director. So if you give us some feedback, this is what we want to do for you guys, and this is what I want to do. Um, some questions for you, Jeannie. Yeah. Early on, they asked, uh, Lisa asked, what does the propolis taste like? Uh, it kind of tastes like um, tree sap. You know, um, to me, the, the oil is, I use the oil more because I have canker sores a lot in my mouth. And it, to me, it tastes like olive oil with tree sap in it. And it does have a little bit of a bite to it. It's, it's numbing. Um, in, the, in the alcohol, it just tastes like the alcohol to me, uh, whatever, you, whatever you make it in. Um, and it's, we take it straight. You can hide the alcohol, you can hide it in a drink. And not really taste it. You can, you know, you know, it's got alcohol in it, but it's not real strong. 
Yeah. And, and, and I'll say the same thing. I, we, we buy stuff from Jeannie, my wife does, and we use it around the house also. Uh, now you can't, Jason, oh, you can't eat, you can't eat propolis raw, but if you chew it, it will turn your teeth orange and it doesn't go away very fast. It's not a real pretty look. So be forewarned, but I have used it. I used to get canker sores on the back, on the side of my tongue. And I was a school teacher and then talk all day. And it would just rub and rub and rub. And so I'd take a piece of propolis and make it, you know, roll it around and make it warm like wax and stick it on a tooth back that's rubbing against the canker sore in my mouth. So you can't eat it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Jason England's got a question. Can you give us a brief synopsis on how to collect propolis, the yield per trap? And I can't recall what you use for the trap. Okay. Um, to me, the traps that they have out there that they sell at the bee companies are not real great. Um, first of all, the bees will fill a space that is three eighths of an inch or smaller with propolis. If you make it any bigger than that, they'll put wax in it and you don't want the wax. Anything that starts being shaped like wax, like a hexagon, has got too much wax in it. So anyway, if you put a propolis trap on and needlepoint canvas with three eighths of an inch smaller holes is actually better because it's real flexible. Um, the ones that they sell are so stiff. What you're supposed to do is put it on top of your top box, block the lid open. They never tell you that. Doesn't work if you don't block the lid open. There has to be light coming through it or they won't fill it. So you put a stick under your lid. Then you take it off once it's filled with propolis, put it in a big garbage bag, put it in the freezer. Then you're supposed to be able to just twist it like this inside the trash bag when it's frozen and it's all going to fall off, but that doesn't really happen. You spend a lot of time picking at it with your hive tool to get it off. If you had it on, you can even use window screen or lightweight um, hardware cloth that has small holes in it and put that on. Um, those are easier because you can roll them up, put a rubber band around it, freeze it, and then you can really manhandle it and get all that propolis to break off. Um, the other thing that we do is we put flat thumbtacks on the rims of the boxes of our hives so that when you put the next box on, it raises the box up just a little teeny bit and they'll put, they'll fill that crack with propolis. So then every time you go out to inspect and you take your boxes apart, you can scrape that thing of propolis off. And honestly, Jason, if I, I figured it out one time, if you had about a walnut size amount of propolis, you could make almost two quarts of oil or tincture for your family. Now you don't want it in that form. You want it broken up. You, what you do is bring it back. And every time we inspect, you know, the propolis that's in the way, you don't want to take the propolis away from the bees because it's there for a reason. They need it. But all that propolis that's in the way, when you pull frames out and it stretches out, and you can't get the frames back in because it's so sticky. The stuff that you scrape off, instead of scraping it off in the grass, save it, you know, bring it in the house, put it in a baggie and put it in the freezer and just save it like that until you're ready to deal with it. You wash it and you smash it up a little with a hammer when you're ready to wash it, smash it up while it's frozen, put it in a bucket out in the grass, fill it with cold water and swish it and the beeswax and the pea parts and the grass flows to the top and the propolis sinks to the bottom. And you just keep scooping off the debris, dumping off the dirty water, putting clean water in until you can see the bottom. Then you pour the water off, lay it out on a screen to dry. Just don't leave it where the sun comes up the next morning. Been there, done that. <laughs> and the propolis all melted through the screen. Um, but you could, you could probably get, I mean, we, there are times when, you know, you probably all had a hive or two now and then that is a propolis machine. We got a, one time got a baggie full, a, a sandwich baggie full, 10 ounces of propolis out of one hive at certain times of the year. Fall is when they make the most. But um, you, could, you can collect easily if just with the debris as you inspect in, in a month probably to make enough for your family. All right, Phyllis has a question. So with the bees, are they killed or not since they're not using, since they're not losing their stinger? Excuse me. Oh, the bees, when, they, when you do bee venom therapy, yes, the bees die. Now, there is a lady that does, um, gen, or I can't, remember, oh, uh, can't remember the word she uses, but she actually stings herself and holds the bee while she's stinging until she's ready to have, pull the stinger out and then grabs the stinger underneath the bee with her tweezers and pulls the stinger out without putting 
pulling it out of the bee. And then she marks the bee and takes it back outside to its hive so she doesn't use the same bee again. But that's, that's a lot of work. So yes, the bees die because their stinger comes out. All right, we have a question. When you make the oil-based propolis, how long do you keep it in and how long do you, how long can you keep it and use it? Excuse me. Well, olive oil has an 18 month to two year shelf life. But remember the way you test propolis to see if it's still viable is that it doesn't let milk spoil. We have propolis laying around this house. And, and what I've read about olive oil is even when it tastes rancid, it's not poisonous. It doesn't hurt you. It just doesn't taste good. We have propolis oil laying around our house in different places, you know, nightstand, drawer, medicine cabinet, upstairs, downstairs, and sideways. And we've, we've used, we probably have some that are four years old in our house and still use it. But at least, at least a two year shelf life if you use olive oil. All right. And if you, anybody the tincture, had, oh, tincture lasts forever because it's an alcohol, you know, it's like a preservative. All right. If anybody else has any questions. Oh, all right. Here's another one from Galaxy Note. Does the bee, do the bees die on the glass system for the collecting venom? No, no, they do not because the stinger doesn't go in. So they still have their stinger. And there, there are, um, b different bees do have different amounts of venom. I have read that, um, the, the oldest bees, as they get, as they get close to the end of their life, their venom production actually slacks off. So the bees that are the most potent are maybe those early foragers, you know, um, more, they have more than the house bees do. 